you're seeing in this network is to bring his word, his glory, his grace to the ends of the earth. Love World is touching the world, dedicated to showing the power of God to the nations. It's time we bring the power of God to America and the world back on the screen. Welcome to your Love World. Today you're going to see a very powerful interview I did a few years ago with Oral Roberts. It's never been shown on TV. This was an in-depth conversation where he and I sat uh, together, very intimate, and I asked him questions about his life, ministry, family. In fact, Evelyn at the time gave me the questions to ask Oral. One of the most powerful interviews I've ever done in my life. I've been in the ministry 43 years, and the Lord has really uh, given me the, the privilege to know people like Oral and Rex Humbard and many, many others, of course. But uh, the interview I did with Oral, I felt I needed to put it on tape. And to my shock, he had told me at the time that no one else had ever done that for him. And so this is a a piece of church history. A lot of uh, pastors, I'm sure, will enjoy watching this because Oral Roberts talked about uh, in-depth uh, things in his life. And uh, it was uh, a part here and there was quite emotional just listening to him. So I'd like you to sit back and just watch and learn and be blessed. Uh, a lot of you young preachers and young Christians, uh, this is going to really affect I believe, affect not only your life, but possibly even affect your destiny. So here's uh, Oro Roberts and myself talking about the most precious things to do with the Lord and His work. Watch this. The remarkable life of Oral Roberts. Again, today we continue in this most amazing time with my dearest friend, Dr. Oral Roberts. I have had such a wonderful time talking to you and listening to you, finding out what God has done with you throughout the years. And today what I want to talk to you about is the university. God gave you the vision for the university while you were praying for the sick. Why did you wait till the 60s to start the university? Well, according to the knowledge I have, I have never done anything until God first spoke to me, Billy. I have never undertaken any major thing without hearing God's voice. And in the beginning of my ministry, when he was, I was being carried to be healed of tuberculosis just after my conversion, the Lord said to me, son, I'm going to heal you and uh, you take my healing power to your generation said that to me three times. And then he said, someday you're to build me a university based on my authority and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Well, the healing ministry was raging and burning in my spirit right after I'd been raised up from a sick bed of 163 days with tuberculosis in the last stages. And I was burning inside to, 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 to go to my generation with it because in those days healing was relatively unknown and scarcely preached by the historic churches and, and even ch churches who believed in it were, were not very deeply involved in it. And the world and the nation knew very little about healing. So I was thrown into the, into the heart of the unknown about the healing power of God and it took some, some 20 years to acquaint this nation and the body of Christ with his healing power. I wasn't the only one, but perhaps I was probably on the firing line a little more. And I had to wait then until God's time came to, to build me a university. 
based on my authority and the Holy Spirit. But what I did during all those years, when I would go through a city, I would visit the universities, I'd visit the, their libraries. When I went overseas in crusades, I looked up to the universities, I met the presidents, I carried this thing like a pregnant woman. I carried the Oral Roberts University in my being mm -hmm. like a pregnant woman carries a baby. And I knew that I knew that someday, but I couldn't do it until God says, now is my time. And I began my healing ministry in 1947. And then in 1963, we chartered Oral Roberts University and began to build the first buildings. Now, Doc, when you started the university, how did it start? Well, it started under tremendous opposition and confusion in the United States. In the 60s, the uh, drug problem had begun. The Vietnam War was tearing the nation apart. College students everywhere were, were burning uh, buildings on the college campuses and locking presidents in their offices. There was violence in this country. It was the most difficult time for God to say to me, build me a university and now is the time. It was the last thing that anybody would expect to be done in the critical time of the 60s. If you lived in the 60s, you remember what I'm talking about, how this country was torn apart. And he came along and said to me, this will not be your university. Your name will be on it so people will know what it stands for. So, but I'm not building Oral Roberts University. I'm building my university through you. And you're to build it on my authority and on the Holy Spirit. God was fed up with the confusion and the violence in this nation. And besides that, in the Pentecostal realm in which I had grown up, there was a suspicion of higher education. They were afraid that you could not uh, keep your spirituality and go to college where they were uh, holding evolution not as a theory only, but as a fact. And, and where there were not rules and regulations and where hundreds of universities which had begun spiritually uh, by churches and by denominations were now secular and wouldn't have anything of a spiritual nature on the campus and they didn't want to trust their kids to schools like that. So how did you overcome that? How did I overcome it? By sheer obedience. Thank God. <laughs> By looking the devil in the eye and saying, I'm going to obey God. Oh, Amen. <laughs> Amen. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any land. I didn't have any buildings. I didn't have any faculty. Or, I didn't have any students. I didn't have any know-how. I only had the voice of God Thank that you, I had Jesus. tested through the healing ministry and where uh, hundreds of thousands of people had come to believe in my integrity and in my anointing and where thousands upon thousands of people had been saved and healed by the power of God. And I had built a base uh, in all 50 states and in many foreign countries. Now, can I ask you something? When you were in the healing ministry, did you ever talk about the university publicly? I always mentioned it but it was like people had no idea what I was talking about. I kept it before them, but uh, they didn't know what I was talking about. And when you started, was well, there opposition? When I started, the first thing that happened when I announced it to my associates, we had 800 people working for us in the office and 12 top men, and they mutinied on me. They said, you're gonna leave the healing ministry to build a university Therefore, we are resigning. Goodness. And they called me into this room, and I sat there, and they told me this. And I said, well, I can never leave the healing ministry because I, God called me to of take course. his healing power to my generation. But how can you merge it with higher education? And they understood the condition of higher education in this country at that time. 
They also, uh, many of whom were uh, from, from a background of suspicion of higher education. I had few college graduates working for me and mostly uh, kids who went to high school or not kids, but uh, older, uh, older people. And they were f scared. Above all, they didn't want to lose the precious healing ministry which God had given me. And that was the last thing that I wanted to lose. But God spoke to me and told me, I want you to build me a university and I want you to merge it with your healing ministry. I don't want you to build a university that has a ministry. I want you to build a ministry that has a university. That's powerful. I want you to build it out of the healing ministry that I have given you and given to the people. And I said, God, how in the world can I do that? I have not the slightest idea. Speak to me, Lord. Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah. Please talk to me. And God talked to me like I was a little child. And I listened like a little child. Mm. And he led me to pay down on a piece of ground just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is my home. Uh, and we bought 240 acres. We paid down on it, but it was vacant. Just How did you find it? <laughs> well, we had driven by the property scores of times with my family. And every time the Lord was speaking my heart, there is where I want my university. It was a big farm big house and barn and, 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 and all that, but owned by a very wealthy family who, who said they never would sell it. But we even got out of the car with my family, my four children and my wife, and we stood there, stretched our hands out for God to hold this piece of ground. What year was that, his, Doc? What uh, year was that? What year did, did we buy it? What year did you do that, that you claimed it? What, what well, we year claimed it in the 50s before we built it in the 60s. We, we claimed the land, wow. the, the specific piece of land. And you knew it. Oh my, I knew that I knew that I knew. Well, anyway, when the uh, top men uh, mutinied on me, I said, well, men, I'm called of God to build him a university to start. He, uh, like he told me, he said, I want you to build it out of the same ingredient that I used when I made the world. And in the book of Job, it says he made the world out of nothing. So I had nothing in my hands. And they knew that, of course. I didn't have any money to do anything with except to carry on my healing ministry. And uh, by that time, I was on national television and uh, had quite an audience. Uh, and uh, results through the television. And I said, well, I love you. I hate to lose you but I have to obey God. And a quietness fell over the room. And Mr. Engel, uh, who was the head of the office, a longtime friend of mine said, well, Brother Roberts, if you'll just step out of the room a little while, we'll pray and talk and then we'll call you back. And I went out of that room and I sat down and I said, Lord, there's nothing new now because every time I've got to start by myself. I've never had any mentors. I've never had anybody laying their hands on me. I've never had anybody tell me that they were for what I was about to do because he never told me to do anything that somebody else had done. Everything was always new that I hadn't had any experience with. And I said, if I lose them, I lose them. But I know you give me others. And so they called me back in and said, now we feel okay. Mm. We're, we're going with you all the way Thank because God. we know you're going to, to bring up this university directly out of the healing ministry. And I said, look, success without a successor is failure, men. And I'm going to die someday. So are you. So is everybody else. And it's been difficult to, to raise up the healing ministry, not alone, but almost alone in America, and to suffer the persecution that I, that I have gone through. But if I die, my part of it, the major part that's going on through national television, will probably die too. 
and the millions of sick people out there who have begun to have hope, what about them? And I said, I can't leave the healing ministry, but I can reach down inside it and bring up an academic university that will match anything in this country by the time we get it going and will be a whole person university based on God's authority and the Holy Spirit, not just words, but something we'd actually do, body, mind, and spirit. The academic, the spiritual, and the aerobic, because we wanted to develop the young people's bodies since this was a healing ministry. We wanted to keep the spiritual going uh, through uh, uh, chapel programs that were designed to lift the, the young people and develop them spiritually because that came out of the healing ministry too. And then we want an academic program that'll, that'll match in its field anything in the state of Oklahoma or the Southwest or the United States. That, that in, in our field, nobody will surpass us. Now, I want to ask just quickly, how did you merge the healing ministry with the university in those days? Well, the Lord said to me, I want you to build a prayer tower in the center of the campus and you build it 200 feet high. And way up there, you take the prayer group that you've already organized, uh, well, you've begun to take 24 hour day uh, phone calls from all over the nation and the world. I want you to put them way up there 200 feet high. And I want them on 24 hours a day in eight hour shifts. And he laid out to me how someday we'd be getting a million phone calls a year mm. for healing prayers. That's one way. And you put it in the center of the campus because on one side will be the residence halls or dormitories and the dining room. On the other side will be the academic buildings and they'll have to pass the prayer tower going and coming every day, which will speak to them of the, of the power of prayer and the power of God. So that's why you put it in the center. That's put it in the center. And we had all kinds of, <laughs> of opposition. And you talk about mockery and editorials that, 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 that this guy, Roberts, who's a healing preacher, says he's going to build a major university. And they were laughing and mocking and said, and you're going to put a prayer tower in the center of the campus. And I was out there saying, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do. <laughs> now, listen, just before we go on, because I, that's so many questions I got. <laughs> when you got the land for the university, I understand you walked on the land. I walked out the land. Can you tell me about that? Yes because I admitted to God I didn't know how to build him a university. How would it be his? What would be distinguished about it uh, uh, that would measure up to him and, mm. and, and the Word of God? How could I have young people come out of a nation that was confused and full of violence and the Vietnam War cutting everybody apart and come in with authority. How could I put in an honor code, which he's spoken in my heart, and put kids under rules and regulations? And he told me, he said, you require the, the young men to wear uh, shirts and ties and the young women to wear dresses and to have uh, a, a time at night to, to, to come into to, to their dorms, curfews, and you put them under authority and you require class attendance. At that time, uh, virtually most universities uh, did not require class attendance. It, it, as long as you studied and got your lessons, you could graduate. But he said, I, I want the teacher's influence to be on the kids. Mm. I don't want them to come in there without a teacher and listen to a bunch of tapes or, or uh, stay out or, uh, and miss class and, and have no responsibility. Said, I want a responsible uh, university campus. And uh, so I went out to the piece of land upon which we had only paid down. And we didn't, we didn't have the money to, to buy the land. We only had money to pay down. And I walked that land almost every day for weeks. 
And Richard, my son, who's the president now, was just a little boy. And he would walk with his dad. And I would, I don't mind admitting, there are times I would cry. I couldn't keep the tears back because I didn't know how mm. to build God a university. And I'd walk and I'd pray. And one day, I said, God, you said build it on the Holy Spirit. How am I going to do that? The academic world will mock us. The professional world will laugh at us. People in general will not understanding, understand building an academic university on the Holy Spirit. What is this that you're talking to me about? and the prayer language of the Spirit, or speaking in tongues, came up out of my belly area. And from my mouth came the most beautiful language in tongues. I had done just a little of that during my Christian experience. I didn't know a lot about it. And here it came out of my mouth. And when it ceased a few minutes later, here came something like prophecy, which I learned was interpretation. I didn't even know about in interpretation much then. And the interpretation of the tongues came, and the voice of God came out of it to my, my spirit and to my mind. What to do, and then pictures came in my mind not just words, but pictures of the buildings being built, pictures of the faculty coming to me from all over the nation, pictures of kids getting on buses and planes and cars driving to Tulsa, pictures of the chapel, pictures of the aerobic center, pictures, if you go back to the campus and walk through it, you will see what I saw in 1961 and two. I saw what you see. When I walk through the campus now, my heart comes up into my throat because I say to my, myself, Lord, I saw this before one building was built. So you, you had a vision? Yes, it must the have been. Of the university. It must have been a vision of a whole person university. I saw the classrooms I saw the kids coming into a Holy Ghost filled professor. The Lord said, you hire only professors who are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And there were not enough of those in the United States for me to start that university with that I could find. And the Lord said, well, you finance them. You send off the best ones you have to universities or you find those who are, who are interested, those coming to your crusades, ask who has an, uh, a, an earned doctor's degree and, and have them to meet you. Or those who, who, who had it, uh, had the degree, but mm. didn't know what I was talking about, meet me and I'll explain it to you. And currently, along with the full gospel businessmen under Demas Shikarian, who was leading many through to, to the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and some of those had earned doctor's degrees. And I was this, uh, uh, with Demas when he founded the Full Gospel of Businessmen and was his, his, his main speaker for several years and, and threw my whole influence back of him. And so he began to help me. And the Full Gospel of Businessmen began to help me. And the first thing you knew, 85% of our first year's faculty had the earned doctorate and every one of them was baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Oh God. Never happened in the history of this nation. Benny, I want to give you a scripture that was in my spirit all the time. It never left me. In 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed or intimidated mm -hmm rightly dividing the word of truth. I grew up among uneducated people. My parents went to the third grade. 
I'm the only one in my family who finished high school, who went to college, who went to university. I'm the only one in my family. And uh, I grew up among those people, blue collar people. I was a blue, blue collar kid. And I love them. They're, they're the very heart of my heart. But uh, they feared higher education and many of them felt like they didn't have the money to send their kids. And I wanted something that had not been built. I wanted our people who knew God, who had this Holy Spirit, mm. in raising their children, not to let them grow up without an education and not have a chance in life, because I grew up without a chance in life. I, I ran away from home at age 15 in order to stay in high school. I had been through that and I knew I would never get into college because I had always planned and dreamed of being a lawyer. So I knew I didn't have a chance if I didn't stay in school. How did your dream become reality? The dream became a reality through a group of people from all 50 states in Canada, primarily, and some from uh, three or four other nations. They were my partner base. They were mostly the little people who gave 10 and 20, $30 a month to carry on my healing ministry and to, and to keep me on nationwide television for which I had to pay a large sum of money each week. They had been blessed. And so I wrote a letter and told them what God had told me specifically. They had heard me say it, but they had never heard the specifics. And I laid out what I was going to build out of the healing ministry that had blessed their lives and that they had no fear that Oral Roberts University would be like a university that started right, but then went secular. They would have a university that they would be proud of. They would have one for their kids to come and they could trust their kids with us. We'd send them back better than they sent them to us. And I began to say, will you come to Tulsa for three days and I will give you room and board and let me present this university to you. And they came in, in sometimes 300, sometimes a thousand. And l later on as the, as the school opened and they could see it with their eyes, uh, we, we got up 3,000 coming. And I would present projects. I never raised funds. I never raised money. I raised projects. I took each building and broke it down into hundreds of little parts. And I would say, would, would you sponsor one of these parts? Which one of these hits your heart? Which one of you is the Lord saying that's yours? Is it a dormitory room? Is it a bed in a dormitory room? Is it a desk? Is it a set of books for the library? Because I'd said, I'm going to build a library with a million copies of books and items. A million copies, which is a fact today in the Oral Roberts University Library, it has a million copies. Oh God. It's a hundred million dollar library today. And it had nothing when we started. Well, I, and uh, would you sponsor one book, five books, 10 books? I presented projects and they got excited. They got turned on big time and they believed every word I said because they had tested me that I had integrity and I'd never broken my word with them and I had never done something in my ministry of which they'd be ashamed. I was the husband of one wife that I loved. I had a family that I was faithful to and I wasn't perfect, but I was godly. And they believed in me, and they believed in the vision, particularly when I told them what God had said. He said, you raise up your students to hear my voice, to go where my light is dim. My voice is heard small, my power is not known, even to the uttermost bounds of the earth, their work will exceed yours, and in that, I'm well pleased. And they saw I was not trying to build something for myself. 
I was building it for them and for their kids. I was building it for people in this country who want discipline and responsibility and, and uh, academic excellence, and they want to come to a university that looks like one, that's got 20 major buildings that look like it's the 22nd century. I mean, God said, when you build me a building, don't use concrete blocks, so there's no, nothing wrong with that. I want you to build me a, a most beautiful building that in itself testifies of excellence and of my desire to prosper my people. So when the kids came and they saw all of that and they wore their ties and shirts and their dresses and uh, at meals, in, in uh, classrooms, in chapel, they felt good about themselves. They felt like they could go out and conquer the world. And many of them who are doing that right now have been, been approximately 27,000 coming through Oral Roberts University since it opened in 1965. When you dedicated the university, yes. I know that I know that Billy Graham came. What happened there? I was at uh, his Congress on Evangelism as a delegate that he's invited among pastors from all, all over the world in Berlin. And uh, one day he invited me to a, a little dinner he was having with his associates, about 15. And when it was over, he said, Oral, when are you going to invite me to speak in chapel at ORU? And I said, well, Billy, and then it hit me. How would you like to dedicate Oral Roberts University? He said, I would like that. And we set the date right then and there in uh, April 1967. And Billy Graham, that mighty man of God, who's incomparable in this generation, came to Tulsa. 18,000 people showed up on campus with him and me, and my staff, and he stood up and he spoke and dedicated Oral Roberts University, and he laid this down before the people. He said, if Oral Roberts University ever leaves its founding purpose, May God pronounce a curse upon it. And my flesh trembled because I know how hard it is to start something, then later how easy it is to change it. And I had a rule that I, I was not married to methods, but I was married to principle, that I wouldn't change the principle. And the founding of the university on the authority of God and His Holy Spirit and upon excellence was the principle, and he saw it. And he said, may God pronounce a curse upon ORU if it leaves its founding purpose. And every year, several times a year in chapel, we, we, we remind the students and the faculty of what our friend Billy Graham said. And believe me, the influence of that man has meant something to Oral Roberts University staying with its founding purpose. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with him? Well, I love him. I don't think there's anybody else like him or has been like him in, in the last hundred years. I think he and his wife Ruth are as sweet a people and as godly people. They raised a great family. They've been the friends of many people, including my family and myself. He has uh, helped me, as he has so many others, in critical times, and he's called upon me sometimes to do a few things that uh, he felt like only I could do. And uh, I don't know anybody that I love more and believe in more than I do. Billy Graham, and now his son, Franklin. I sure admire that fine young man. You and Billy Graham and Rex. We've been close, Billy and I have, since 1950. Since 1950. 
when he asked me to lead in prayer in his fort in Portland, uh, Oregon Crusade. And we have been, at least from my heart, I've been very, very close to him. And Rex Humbard. Uh, and Rex Humbard, of course, was the man who, was in, who inspired me from an earthly standpoint to go on national television direct from the big tent cathedral with the 10,000 people sitting out there and with the healing line live. And he stayed after me until I went to God and then heard from God himself. And uh, he's, he and Maud Amy are two of the dearest friends I've ever had. She's one of the greatest singers I've ever heard and Rex is pure gold. Do you know, Doc, you and Billy and Rex have left a mighty impact on earth. Maybe nobody has said that to you, but I want to today. Thank you. You have left a mighty, mighty impact on the globe. You and Billy and Rex have left such an impact that to this day it's affecting the world. And in 2,000 years of church history, very few men stand out. I count you in my eyes as I see the apostles in the Holy Church. And there's you, and there's Billy, and there's Rex. Thank you. I love you with all my heart, and you know that. Well, you're very kind. I'm in my field, and Billy's in his field, and Rex is in his field. There's never been any competition. We've always loved and, and valued each other. And God has used you in such a mighty way, all three of you. Thank God for you. But uh, you make me want to cry. <laughs> I want to ask you, when you started the university, at that time, God also spoke to you about doing specials, primetime specials. Why did you do that? And can you tell me a little more about that? I was married to principles, but never to methods, because methods change. People change in the way they look at things. And methods have to, have to be adapted, but you hold to your principle. You don't change the Word of God, and you don't change the call of God on your life. And the Lord came to me in 1969 and uh, reminded me that I had reached out to America and the nations of the earth in big auditoriums and the big 10,000 seat tent cathedral and taken his healing power all across my generation. This is your generation, but that was my generation he said, now, I want you to use a new method for several years. I want you to do primetime television specials. And I want to be on the biggest stations in the United States. I want you to get star, guest stars who are like Pat Boone, Mahalia Jackson, people that have a national following. I want them to be your, your, your guest star. I want you to bring healing through your preaching. Then I want you to get Oral Roberts University singers, a dozen of them, and really train them with the finest voices that, that, that can be had. And I want them to sing good songs, but not all religious songs, but end it with a great hymn. I want you to build a program that will attract the attention of unchurched people, of unsaved people, I, and, and in that I want you to have healing power of mind at the heart. And I want this country to see. I'd never done it, never heard of it, never thought of it. I started out without any money and I called them partners back to Tulsa and, and asked them, would, would you sponsor two minutes of the time on the, on, on the air, or five minutes of the time. Will you give me the money for the first primetime special, which was 
at that time uh, about $300,000 for one week's prime time special on 175 of the big V stations. And it's prime time, which was very costly. And they believed me again. You know, it's something to, for people to believe in you for 56 years. I never get over my gratitude of the confidence that people have had in me. And you protected your partners. Well, I did. I, I'd rather die right now than to lose the Holy Spirit in my life or to lose my obedience or to lose my faithfulness. If I were to fall, I couldn't stand it. I must obey God. And it's the sweetest life that a person can live. Well, when those prime time specials hit the country, it was new and people were looking for something new. And we had an audience. And as they grew week by week and year by year, one year, Elvis Presley had the largest prime time special rating on one, one of his specials and we were number two in the United States. That's and amazing. the mail went out of sight. One year we received seven million letters. We, 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 we heard from people who said that they hadn't been to church in, in, in 10, 20 years. We heard from people in every walk of life. The black people loved that. And we were able to wind up with 17% of the student body of Royal Roberts University black. Only 13% of Americans are black, but 17% of the student body of ORU are black. You talk about integration. ORU is a university that is integrated. But, but the primetime specials put everything up high and healing went out across America greater than it had in the Big Ten. How did you respond to all those letters? We answered them. Uh, no, but in those days when there wasn't the, you know, we, technology we have we today. We went to, to IBM, the big computer company, and told them we had to have computers in which we could call a person's name. And we could say back to them in our answer what they had said to us they wanted us to pray about. We wanted to write as personal a letter as the President of the United States in the White House can do through the finest equipment in the world. So you were the first one to do this? We, we, we were the creators of the methodology that uh, came into being. That many ministries use now. Well, uh, we were the creators of it. We, we uh, went to IBM personally and uh, uh, showed them what we wanted which they first said couldn't be done at that stage of, uh, of America's life. But together, we put it together and brought it to Tulsa. And then no word went in the letter that I hadn't said. They got my words and my prayers in those letters. And people could feel it. And they began to get healed through those letters. And often you sent letters written by uh, hand? Oh, uh, sometimes you couldn't answer by the, by the new method. And I would sit down with Evelyn, my wife, and we would answer by hand. And we did that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people hmm. until our hand almost wore out. Uh, the whole thing about my ministry has been the call of God on my life and healing to pray for people, because prayer changes things. Now, can I ask you something else here quickly? Uh, the city of faith, when did God put that in your heart for the city of faith? I put that in my heart in 1977, that he wanted to merge his healing streams of prayer and medicine. And he showed me that all the food that people eat come out of his earth. And therefore, all medicines that people use come out of the earth. And the earth is the Lord's, 
and the fullness thereof, the Bible, thereof, the Bible says. And many people were very lackadaisical on medicine, neglecting their bodies. And even those who believed in prayer, many of them didn't believe in medical care. And I was in the healing ministry. It didn't matter to me how the person got healed. If, if God healed them uh, through medicine or healed them through prayer, give God the glory. We thank the doctor and we're grateful to the one who prayed for us, but doctors can't heal you and ministers who pray for, uh, for the sick can't heal you. Only God can heal. God is the source. And uh, he told me to merge medicine and prayer. And uh, we had it going nine years in the city of faith. And there was tremendous opposition which I really don't want to get into because it's not worth it. But when we had to close it, and the head of the American Medical Association came down to preside, he said to me, Dr. Roberts, you must not be discouraged in having to close this in the medical school. We had turned out 333 medical doctors. He said, he said you have forever changed medicine in the nation. He said, everywhere now, doctors are opening to prayer. Hospitals are opening to prayer. And I know that to be true because the hospitals I have been in as a patient and the doctor's offices I have been in, prayer is as welcome as the flowers in May. And before the city of faith, I've been there when I wasn't even welcome myself. I'm into, and, and the Lord said to me, ideas are more important than brick. Mm. And I knew all the time how long this, the buildings would stand. But I wanted to send the idea of prayer and medicine coming from me and people being healed through me when they're prayed for or they're medicated and, and it works. I'm the one who heals and you are the one I chose to announce that and to merge prayer and medicine on a national and world scale. And so my heart is at peace. City of Faith is, 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 is now part of the endowment of, of, of Oral Roberts University. So ideas, concepts, and insights are what God worked with. And it accomplished its purpose. It more than accomplished its, its purpose. I can't go anywhere where there are doctors who don't call me off and thank me. And I don't want to be thanked because it's, it's the Lord who, who did that through me. But, but, but they say, you changed everything for us. You changed everything for us. And you know, you, uh, uh, I've just been and had a procedure done in my body. <laughs> and I said, is it all right that uh, I have someone stand by who's, who's praying. He said, I would like for every one of my patients to have someone standing by praying while I'm doing medical procedures on them. And this man is one of the great doctors in, in the world, not only America. Uh, it was such a pleasure to hear him say that and see him smile and to, and to feel that, uh, that God is in that hospital. Can you tell me about your athletic programs at the university? Why did you do that? Well, you're getting into something new again. Uh, I was an athlete, not a great one, but one who can make the team. And uh, when the university was coming on, he reminded me of something. And the Lord reminded me that 50 million men when they pick up the newspaper every morning, they scan the front page and turn to the sports page. That's right. And he said, I want you to get their attention. I want you to go into in the NCAA, at the highest athletic uh, program in the United States. And we had gotten fully accredited in just six years. Only two, only one other in America got accredited that quickly. Usually it takes 10 to 20 years. 
and the same year we joined the NCAA, six years. And in the seventh, I believe it's 1974, when our basketball team, out of 300 teams in America and the greatest schools in the country, we had come to the final eight and lost in overtime or we'd have been in the final four. And our athletic program put Oral Roberts University on the map. I mean, people who saw that mm. sports page and the, and the sports people, uh, the news media, didn't jump on the sports program like they had jumped on me for building ORU and for being in the heating ministry. They lifted up the athletic program and still do, of course. And uh, the athletic programs of ORU have just absolutely captured the attention of millions of people and, of course, ORU. God and used, uh, ORU brings the gospel. And God used that. He, God uses it. Now, let me ask you one other question. Has Oral Roberts University met your expectations? Oral Roberts University has gone so far beyond what I thought it could possibly be that I have to almost pinch myself to look at it and recognize it and see it. And better still, to realize that the son of my flesh and my spirit and my wife is the president and is carrying it on as good or better than his dad did. It's a miracle. Uh, when I was 75, the Lord had let me know that that year I was to give up the presidency of the university I founded. And I went to the board, and it was open for nominations for the succeeding president. And without a dissenting vote, it was unanimous for my son, Richard, who had been preparing himself for 10 years as executive vice president, had been with me in everything I had done, almost. And probably was the only man in the whole world that was really suited Amazing. to follow in my steps in, the, in, in heading up that university. And I want to give God thanks Amen. and give my son credit Amen. for the remarkable job that he is doing. Because when I left OR, you had around 4,000 students. And he has 5,700 now. And he has an hour of healing five nights a week live. And the healing ministry is as strong under Richard as it was under me. It, he uses the word of knowledge more than I did. God used my right hand more than he does him. But he has carried it on, and I'm so much at peace because I never forget what the Lord spoke in my heart when I was at my peak and I was young enough to, to carry it all out. Success without a successor is failure. I used to tell my partners when they came to Tulsa to help me build the university, which it was uh, several hundred million dollars. You and I can't afford to die before we've done something for God. And we can't afford to die until we've left something. And what better can we leave than a university that's fully accredited recognized worldwide, has, has over 60 majors, bachelor's, master's, and doctor's degrees, and is moving forward and is right on its founding purpose. What better thing could we leave for our children and our grandchildren? And, oh, and so, God help us that we remember that success without a successor is failure. And to see those students, bright faced, studying hard, uh, yeah, doing their uh, aerobics, developing their bodies, coming to chapel, the first time that I saw those thousands of kids pray in tongues in chapel at the same time, I thought it was angels sing singing. I never heard thousands of voices singing in tongues at the same time. And 
they had the same tune and neither one of them knew what the other one was, was singing. And when you go to the chapel, and I hope you get a chance to visit the OU chapel, they, they have it twice a week. And listen to those kids. See them with their hands up worshiping God. Where we bring in some of the finest uh, speakers in the world just to, to, to share with them. It's an experience. I am so thankful for my healing ministry that goes on because the kids come out of there knowing how to pray for the sick. And they, uh, in the summertime, they, many of them, hundreds of them, go all over the world in the nations of the earth and they're winning souls all over this planet. Benny, I can't thank God enough and I can't thank Benny Hinn enough for being a member of the board of trustees of Oral Roberts University. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. One thing I did want to ask you about that's very special to both of us. Uh, your relationship with Catherine Kuhlman. Mm. It was precious. She was God's handmaiden. When I first heard her in Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles through my television producer, who was her television producer, who had, who, who had told me about her and asked me to go and listen to her, when I sat there up in the balcony by myself and she walked out on the stage and began to preach and then through the word of knowledge began to call people out of the audience who were desperately ill, some of them hopelessly crippled and they got up and they walked and they were healed or being healed. I cried so hard that I, I, could, I couldn't control the sobs that went through my body as, as the Holy Spirit moved through me and let me know that this was a chosen vessel of God. And then she was invited to do the baccalaureate at Oral Roberts University and she wowed the kids. What I mean by that, she captured them by the Holy Spirit. And many of their lives were, were changed. And then we met in my home and we, we met in other places and became very close, close friends. And I did her funeral. Can you tell me about that? Well, I had expected uh, some of those who had been members of her team to do the funeral. I never thought about I would be asked. And uh, I didn't feel like that I was one, uh, had been that much a part of her traveling ministry as other ministers had. I could call some names. And, but the pressure was put upon me. I, that's the best way I can say it. That uh, I'm the one who should do it because I was nationally known and so on. You, you know how people can approach you. And I flew to Los Angeles and there was her team, her precious team that had stood with her through the years. And uh, I even went to them and said, I'll be glad to step aside. And they didn't, apparently they didn't want me to do that. So I, I did the funeral and I did the best that I could. It was an honor, of course, to do the funeral. You told me that when you went in to pray for her in the hospital before she died, she did not want you to pray That's for right. her. She asked me to take my hand off of her because she pointed up and she said, it's my time to go and I want to go. And so I, so I took my hand away and when they came in to do the heart surgery through a heart surgery friend of mine, a very close friend, by the way, came out and told me that Catherine was gone. I said, yes, doctor, I could have told you that. 
because her time, her appointment, as our appointment will come, had come. And I'm looking forward to my appointment. I don't know how many years or months or days God will give me on this earth, but I'm already thinking about what he's going to have me do when I go over there, what assignment he's going to give me, because I'll be busier there than I am on this earth. And I know I'm going straight to heaven when my heart stops beating. You've had many trials. You've had many difficulties. What kept you going? My faith and my obedience to God. My obedience. When I say I fear God, I'm not talking about being scared of God, but I have rever reverential awe of God. And I have an appreciation for obedience and for his call on my life beyond my ability to explain. I love to obey God. It's the most paying thing I've ever had. You had some painful experiences. You lost a son. You lost a daughter. Yes. It hurt. My, my daughter and son-in-law were killed in a plane crash in a storm over Kansas, which, and I lost them, and, and we had to help take their three children, little children, and help raise them. And they've all turned out well. They're, 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 they're all uh, serving the Lord. And my older son, son, Ron, who had come out of the service of the Vietnam War, uh, had gotten on drugs. And he was already married and had, had, had two children. And the devil made him believe that he couldn't overcome them. And my older son, Ronnie, that I love so dearly, and had so much promise. He's only that far from his earned PhD, a doctorate, and he was, uh, he, he knew the Bible so well, he took his life. Or at least we think he did. The, the, uh, the police are not sure that he was not murdered, but, but, but it doesn't make any difference now. He's gone. And, uh, we had two wonderful children left, Roberta, my daughter, who is an attorney, graduated from the ORU Law School, and my son Richard, who's the president of ORU. Both of them have earned doctor's degrees, for which I'm thankful. And I have 13 grandchildren and 13 great-grandchildren. How did you overcome then when you heard your son had died? The main thing the Lord spoke in my heart that got me over was, he said, I know something about this that you don't know. And I got up immediately on my national television program with my wife the same week and stood there and told how we felt at the death. And we lifted it off of our heart sharing with the people that we go through trials the same as they do. We're not somebody special. We're just plain people that are trying to obey the Lord and to do His will. And we have losses like other people do. Your wife, Evelyn, she's been your strength all these years. She's been my darling. We, we give each other seven kisses each night before we go to bed. We've been closer than close. Can you in one sentence tell me what her part has been all these years as you've ministered? She's my helpmate. That's what the Bible says, that a woman is to be to a man. And she has been my helpmate. What a blessing. And it's gone beyond even that. I, I know I would have had to have undertaken what I've done without her. But I would hate, hate so much to have to try to do it. 
without Evelyn Roberts. That's precious. One final thing. What would you tell a young man watching who has just started in the ministry? Read the four Gospels and the book of Acts often and look for Jesus. In those five books is the only original information in the world that's in print about Jesus Christ. Look at him. Listen to his words. See his healings, his miracles. And don't just turn out to be a preacher from your mouth, but be one with words that's confirmed with signs following. That's the Bible way. If you had one thing to tell the church, just one thing, what would that one thing be? What I just said. The church has got to be like Jesus. The Lord told me, don't be like other men. You be like Jesus. You heal the people as he did. You don't have to be in the healing ministry like Oral Roberts is or like Benny Hinn is to heal the sick. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall, shall, they shall recover. Every child of God can have a portion of the healing ministry along with your full witness of Christ. I pray I'll have the chance to sit like you are today and talk about my life and be as pure as you are right now. Well, I certainly admire you, Benny. I love your ministry. I love supporting you. I love being your partner. I know when I send a financial gift to the Benny Hinn Ministries that I can trust you. I can trust Benny Hinn. You have integrity and you have the anointing. Would you stretch your hands and pray for our precious people? The Lord God. Be your God. Uh, Lord God, be closer to you than your breath. The Lord God put his hand upon your body and enable you to feel his healing presence. The Lord God pull you to his heart and let you know, that you know, that you know that you're his child and that you will serve him the rest of your life. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen and amen. Oral and Evelyn Roberts are with us today. You see, of course, Suzanne is here today. And, and we are just so delighted to have Oral and Evelyn, whom we love so much. Oral Roberts is my pastor. When I go and sit with him in, in his home and talk with him and he prays with me. Oh, precious moments those are, I tell you. And Evelyn, I'm so glad you came with Oral today. I'm going to say something about Evelyn because, you know, a lot of you precious people may not know this. She is a woman of wisdom and strength. The anointing on her is very strong. There are many times when she has given me a word from heaven, I'll tell you, straight to the heart. <laughs> Evelyn Roberts doesn't mess with words. She just tells you exactly what she thinks. And that's what we all love about you. That's why I'm so slim. She's been trimming me up for 65 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about your relationship and your marriage. And I have a lot to ask. I think the first question I'm going to ask you today is how is it you've been happy all these years? And have you been happy all these years? Who, who are you talking to, her or me? Both of you. <laughs> Benny, I think the first thing that people should think about when they get married is, is this God's will for my life? 
is this the man or the woman I'm supposed to marry? And a lot of people never give it a thought. And they say, well, if this doesn't work out, there's somebody else out there for me. But in my mind, and in Oral's mind, when we married, it was God put us together, first of all. And then we, I said to him, now, if you're ever considering divorce, don't marry me because there will never be a divorce in this family. Uh -huh. Never. It's for life. Well, that's what happened to your dad. Well, my dad and mother divorced when I was four years old, and that affected my life greatly. And I didn't want a divorce in my family. So I said, no divorces, Oral. It's for life. But, uh, you know, I knew two years before we were supposed to marry that, that God had, was going to put us together. I didn't know how he was going to do it, but he spoke to me and told me. This is really something. You've got to hear this. <laughs> he spoke to me and told me that Oral was the man I was going to marry. And uh, I had never met him before. I didn't know anything about his family. I didn't know anything about his preaching. I, I never knew he had had tuberculosis. I never knew all these things. But God spoke to my heart, and I knew it as well as I know I'm sitting here. And Didn't you write during it? the two years, in your diary? yes, I wrote it in my diary that I'm uh, I'm going to I met the man tonight. I'm going and to marry. Tell what your mother said. Well, my mother said, "Have you seen his mother?" And I said, "No. What about her?" Well, she's a little fat Indian squaw. And I said, "Mama, I'm not going to marry his mother. I'm <laughs> going to marry him." Well, anyway. Um, I said, Lord, if this works out, you'll have to work it out because there's no way I can. In those days, Benny, we didn't have telephones. We didn't have a telephone in our home. And a lot of people might have had them, but we didn't. And there was no way to contact each other. I lived in the north part of Oklahoma. He lived in the south part of Oklahoma. And after a camp meeting where we met, I knew we'd, we'd never meet again probably because I would be busy doing something. He'd be busy doing something. I said, Lord, it's in your hands. You'll have to work it out. I went on to school in Texas. I dated other boys. They even asked me, two of them asked me to marry them. I said, no, I'm sorry. You're a fine person, I'm sure. It's nice to be with you. I've enjoyed our friendship, but no, I'm saving myself. There's a certain man. He doesn't know he's going to marry me yet, but he is. Well, and in the meantime, idea. Oral didn't know anything about this until a man asked him one day. He said, Oral, don't you think it's time for you to get married? And Oral said, yes, but I haven't found the right girl. And uh, he said, well, I, I know where the right girl is. Tell me what you want in a girl. So he told me 10, he told this man 10 things he had to have. One of them was I had to cook, and I had to know how to cook, and I had to know how to play the piano, and oh, many other things, he said. And Frank said to him, I know where she is. And he said, where? She's in Texas teaching school. And Oral said, well, I must go see about her. And he promptly came down. And of course, his mother said, if you're going 600 miles to see a girl, I'm going with you. <laughs> and he said, no, Mama, you're not going. She said, I'm going. <laughs> she, w she came with him to see me. And I will not recommend this to a lot of people, but that very weekend we spent together at my grandmother's home in Texas, he asked me to marry him. We had never had a date. We knew God had put us together, so Amazing. why wait? So we, we, we got married and... Four months later. Four months later, yes. Yeah. Uh, they say that there are three things that, that will either keep a marriage together or, or pull it apart. One is communication, one is sex, and one is money. And that one of the three will pull you down if there's any way to pull you down. And the first thing we decided after we married was to have an open communication so that if we had a little problem, Benny, we sat down and discussed it. We didn't let it boil up inside. You know, if you have something against somebody and it just keeps boiling and boiling, it gets to the point, you know, that you, you're overwhelmed and then you lash out at somebody right. and it causes problems. <clears throat> but when we had a problem, we sat down, for instance, um, Oral came home from a crusade one time, and he said to me, uh, Evelyn, come in here and sit down. Put the children to bed and come in here and sit down. I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. I went in there, and I said, what do you need to talk about? He said, well, there's something wrong with our marriage. And I said, oh, really? I hadn't noticed. He said, well, when I come home from a crusade, now remember, he was gone three weeks at a time. 
because I had children I had to take care of. Well, they, were, Once I, in a they while, were my children, too. Well, of course they were your children, too, honey. Without you, I wouldn't have had them. Uh, <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> this is fabulous. You got me tickled now. But anyway, um, he, he said, there's something wrong with our marriage. And I said, well, what is it? He said, well, Evelyn, when I come home from a crusade, you just go around about your business. You don't pay any attention to me. And I said, well, honey... I, every meal I cook, I have you in mind. I fix it, everything I think you like. And I said, I, I try to pay attention to you. What is it I'm not doing? No, you go right ahead with your schedule for children and all these things and you never pay attention to me. And he said, I want more attention when I come home. So I got on his lap and I told him how much I loved him and, and how much I was sorry if he felt like I had not given him enough attention but I realized when he came home, he had been alone so long that he wanted me to pay it, to just leave some of the things that, that the children, I said to him though that night. Hold it right there. The Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. Now go ahead. <laughs> well, he said one time when the maids got to looking good in the hotel, he knew it was time for him to come home. <laughs> now go ahead with what you say. <laughs> I know this sounds crazy. This is happening. This is your day. I love it. <laughs> but, but you know, it, it is true that he wanted attention because he'd been gone so long. And right. I was going ahead with my normal schedule, and I said, Oral, you don't know what a normal marriage is like because you're never home. And he said, I just know I want more attention. You married me before we had children. And I, I want, want you to sit in my lap. <laughs> I sat in your lap and loved you and, and told and you I how much you to I loved hug you. Me and, and kiss me. Yes, I did. <laughs> and uh, every time we've had a problem, we sit down and discuss it like this so that there are no problems that boil up. We, we, you know, sometimes he sits down and tells me, Evelyn, this is what I don't like about you. And you do the same thing. With I do. Me. I say, Oral, this is something I don't like about you. And we sit down and discuss it. And I say, well, I'll try to change, or I'll, I'll, I'll well, do I remember that one when you said you're not paying enough attention to the children. That's right. Tell them about that. Well, you? I felt like when he came home, well, the first day or two he was so tired from the crusades he couldn't think. And I realized he had to just get some rest and not pay attention to anybody. And then after that, when he was, he was only home a week, and I thought he should pay more attention, take the children out and do things with them. And he wanted to get away and play golf and do something to rest his body, which I understood. But even so, the children had no father most of the time. And so I sat him down one day and I said, Oral, when your children are grown, they're not going to know they ever had a father if you don't pay attention to them. I said, you know, you're only home a few days at a time and you've got to pay more attention to your children. Well, he took it to heart, and he really did. He began to spend time with the children, which I think is very, very necessary in a family. And Benny, there's, there are people today who are not living the kind of life that you and Suzanne live and Oral and I live because they're not in the ministry. And these are hard days when women have to work and a man has to work to make a living. The two of them have to work to make a living, and, and that's hard on a marriage, working, two people working and leaving the children at home after school in the afternoons, that's very hard. But it, that's when it's really, really important to make sure that your marriage is going right. There was a scripture that Evelyn and I kept in mind and had an immense uh, impact upon us, and it still does. It's in Mark uh, chapter 10, uh, beginning verse 7, Mark 10, 7. Or Mark 10, 6. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. It's very important that Evelyn and I were male and female. And for this, this cause, because he made us male and female, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother it's very important in our lives that we left both our parents. Both of, I was living at home uh, as a young boy preacher, and uh, she had, but she'd gone away to Texas to teach school. 
but we didn't cease loving our parents, but we physically left them. Now, when you say leave your father and mother, would you explain that? Well, uh, physically, we got out of their house. We came back from time to time. And we loved them, and they really loved us. But, I mean, the relationship, of course, stays oh, the, close. and you The still relationship oh, of course, of course. was uh, strong until they died m many years later. Shall leave his father and mother and cleave only to his wife. And my mother and father had nursed me when I was sick. And they really loved and cared for me. And I walked out. And I begin to cleave to, him, to, to, to this woman, and they shall be one flesh. I think of Evelyn and me, not as two people. Well, God said that, Oral, to you. You remember when he prophesied to you one night, you were lying in bed, I'll never forget it. And he said to you, Oral, when I think of you and Evelyn, I don't think of two people, I think of uh, you as one. We, we both were Christians. Yes. We both were loved Jesus. The Bible was our main book. God called us to each other. We didn't just jump up and say we're going to get married. We didn't live with each other before we married. No, no, no. We, no, we no. didn't j jump up and have an affair. God brought Evelyn and me together. I don't know any other way for a marriage to be successful Absolutely. without God being with both of them and their being with God and then they become one. And that's how the family, the family that you have, the children reflects the oneness of your being in union one with another. Some people say, well, that was back there. And that's not for me anymore. That's a bunch of unscriptural stuff. That's not like God. God says you should be one flesh and you should cater to one another to that and to uh, trying to have the necessary money, the necessary home, and the uh, things that are necessary to live in this life. Now, when you'd face a trial, and you've gone through enough. We've faced trials all the time. But, I mean, you two had to really depend on each other. Well, oh, I know one thing we do when we fuss. <laughs> we, get, we get tickled before we get finished. <laughs> we just have a knockdown and drag out, or we start to have a knockdown and drag out fuss, because I just hate what she did, and she hate what I did, and boy, we just come in toward, e toward each other, and suddenly we get tickled, and we ruin our fuss. <laughs> <laughs> we get to tickle, we forget what we fussed about. We actually forget what we're mad about. You know, one of the problems in marriage, too, these, these days, and maybe it's always been this way, the man is working, the woman is working, and they each have their <coughs> own money. So they have two pots. They, she takes her money and does something with it. He takes his money. Oral and I have always put everything we had in one pot. It didn't have to be a big pot either. No, it wasn't a big pot a lot of times. But anyway, we were, we were one. Some people want to be very independent and, and live their own lives even though they're married. And maybe it works for some people. It wouldn't work for me. Or us. It, it wouldn't work Sue and I are the you know, same. I, I'm thinking about a lot of people out there who are not ministers, you know. There are a lot of people out there who are not ministers who work every day. And, and I think I'm saying to them, look, Begin to be one, not two people, but one. If you're married, you're one. And they should be compatible. Uh, if they're not compatible, sit down and talk about it and say, we loved each other when we married. Now, why don't we love each other now? We're still the same people. That's a big point. We're still the same people. We can work this out. The man across the fence may look a little better to you than the one you have, but you know what? There's no difference. He may have a few problems that your husband doesn't have. Your oh, husband sure. may have a few that he doesn't have. But let me tell you, he'll have a set of problems just like your husband has one if he has. Everybody has problems, and there's nobody perfect. And, and there's no way you can live together. And the same is true of the woman, not just the husband. That's the truth. And there's no way you can live together without, without having disagreements once in a while. You ha but, you know, that really makes life exciting. When you have disagreements and then you can sit down and work them out together, you feel so good when it's over. 
Today I'd like you to pray with God's people that God would bless their homes and families and marriages. I pray that the Lord yes, would bless your family. If I, I really feel led for heaven to lead this prayer. Father, there are a lot of people out there that are hearing us today and watching us. Many of them have very sad homes. Some of them are lonely. Some of them have lost a mate and they're living alone and they're trying to find someone else to marry so they can raise their children. And we just pray that you'll send the right person into their lives so that they will have a happy home <clears throat> and they can raise their children and be like a, a family. And Lord, just help them first of all to know you, to give their hearts to you. That's the main thing in their lives is to give their hearts to you and let you guide their lives. And I pray for those who are in a marriage now but are having big, big problems. Lord, somehow help them to turn to you to get their problems worked out. Yes. And those who are divorced and feel so bad about it, Give them courage and strength in their hearts and help them to know that you still love them and you, you know that they're your children and they're living for you and help them, I pray, to make ends meet in their family. M many single mothers and some single fathers out there sure, are yeah. trying to make their families work and I pray you'll do it in Jesus' name. weeks ago I was having dinner with Oral and Evelyn Roberts whom I love very much I said doc would you come preach for me that morning and he said yes he would and there is no greater preacher I know in America who can bring the healing message to people than Oral Roberts Evelyn I love you we all love you we thank God for you would you stand up you sweetheart give Evelyn Roberts a big God bless you bless you I want you all to stand, please, and let's welcome God's servant, Oro Roberts. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Something good is going to happen to you. And greater is he who's in you than he that's in the world. Thank you very much, and be seated. Many thank you for being God's young apostle of healing. And our hearts go with you throughout the world and your great ministry of anointing of the Holy Ghost. And greetings to every one of you today. Turn in your Bible to, to Daniel chapter 3 and beginning at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, you shall be cast the same hour in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace on seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army 
to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not made out of the right kind of stuff. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered, True, O king. He said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I speak to you briefly today on the fourth man. Like a diamond on a velvet couch, the city of Jerusalem is situated in the geographic center of the earth. It is the city of God, the great king. Here his prophets walked the streets and thundered their prophecies and the righteousness and the laws of God went out to the ends of the earth. Some 600 miles to the east was another city, the greatest the pride and skill of man has ever built, Babylon. The world still talks about Babylon, and Hussein of Iraq is trying to rebuild Babylon this very hour. Its walls were 300 feet high and wide enough at the top for eight chariots to run races side by side. The beautiful Euphrates River wound its way through the city, adding much to the wonder of Babylon. Here was the famous temple of Bel, of Bel, towering 600 feet high, and on its altars, animals were sacrificed before their meat was sold to the Babylonian housewives. Here was the great palace of Nebuchadnezzar, more like a fortress because it was six miles in diameter. Through Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon had become the center of the occult, of Satanism, of witchcraft. The devil had established one of his headquarters in Babylon, and from Babylon went sin to the ends of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar had taken his mighty armies, marched across the face of the known earth, and conquered the nations of the world, and brought back their leaders to Babylon. And then he heard of a people named Israel, of the God of Israel, of the city of Jerusalem that would not bow to him. And one day he took his cracked legions and marched across the hot, burning, shimmering sands of the deserts of Arabia. And with their battering rams, they tore holes in the walls and entered the city because most of the people of God had backslidden. They had ceased giving their tithes and offerings to God, robbing him of their first fruits, and the devourer had been turned loose upon them. And Nebuchadnezzar burned the city to the ground, destroyed the city, and took captives, the brightest young people of that place. Young men like Daniel, young men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want you to see these young men today as they stand on one of the hills overlooking their ruined city. Hear their melancholy words, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, if we ever forget thee, let our right hand forget its cunning and let our tongue cleave to the roof of our mouths. See them again as they march inside the huge walls of the city of Babylon and are ushered down by the river Euphrates and are commanded to sing the songs of God in Babylon 
and hear them say, how can we sing the songs of our God in a strange land? And they hung their harps upon the willows and refused to sing. Before they had become situated to their new surroundings, they heard trumpets blowing and music playing. And to their astonishment, everyone they saw fell upon his face and turned himself toward the great image of gold, a hundred feet high, that was cast in the perfect image of Nebuchadnezzar in which he declared himself to be the God of the world. And their blood froze in their veins for written in the law of God is his command. You shall not bow down to any graven image. You shall not worship any idol God. And they refused to bow. Soon they were ushered into the presence of the king who told them he had heard that they had refused to bow. And he said, I'll give you another chance. If you bow, it shall be well with your soul. If not, I shall cast you in the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, we are not even careful about answering you. We don't have to think what we're going to say. We may burn in your furnace, but we will not bow to your God. And immediately, they were confronted with the two laws of God of this universe, the laws of faith on the one hand, and on the other, the law of compromise. Nebuchadnezzar said, you will bow. You will compromise your religious convictions, your faith in God. You will bow to my image of gold. You will declare that I'm the God of this world. You will bow or you will burn in my furnace. And here we have the law of compromise that's marching in its fury across our world, tempting people, entangling them in its web, and telling all of us, unless we compromise our stand with God, our faith in his omnipotence, in his divine word of God, in his holiness and his way of life, in his miracle working power. If we, comp if we do, do not compromise the name of Jesus being above every name, if we don't compromise our salvation, we shall burn in the devil's furnace. And life's fiery furnaces are heated hot today. In those furnaces are the flames of evil coming against us on every side, telling us we will lose our friends. We will lose our relationships. We will lose our jobs, our businesses, our money, our position in life. We will lose our standing. We will lose everything unless we turn against the miracle working power of the eternal God and bow our knee and worship the gods and the idols of this world. And the devil says, if you don't bow, you will burn. But God says, if you do bow, you will burn. But if you don't bow, I won't let you burn. For the law of faith says, if we refuse to compromise, if we square our shoulders and look in the face of God and say, my Redeemer liveth, and I bow to his name. If we worship the King of kings and Lord of lords, his mighty power will wrap itself around us and subdue the crackling flames and rob the fire of its violence, and we shall not bow. We shall stand, and we shall be preserved by the mighty power of the living God. A young lady was being quoted by a young man, and she finally prevailed upon him to go to church. And they were sitting there that night, and she was worshiping God while her boyfriend was making fun. When the minister finished and made the invitation for people to come and accept Christ, she turned to him and said, don't you want to receive Christ as your personal savior? And he laughed in her face. And she said, you're not serious. 
He said, I am. And she stood up and then leaned over and said to him, all right, if you won't go to heaven with me, I'm not going to hell with you. And she turned and walked away. The law of compromise destroys. It pulls you down, but the law of faith lifts you up. The law of faith makes God real in your life. The law of faith brings the healing power into your mortal flesh. The power of faith delivers you from sin, disease, demons, and fear, and poverty, and the occult, and everything unlike God. The, the power of faith brings the joy of heaven in your soul, and the bells of glory ring out in your spirit. There is a law of faith, and there is a law of compromise. And when they said to the king, we don't even have to think what we'll say, we won't bow. We may burn in your furnace, but we'll not bow to your God. And there was a thrill that went through heaven. And when the king summoned his soldiers and said, I want you to cast them into the furnace, but first heat it up seven times hotter than ordinary, the fourth man rose up off this father's right side and stood over the portals of heaven ready for a flight. And when the mighty soldiers picked up these men to throw them in, they didn't know it, but the fourth man leaped into time and space and coming faster than the speed of light, he entered the burning fiery furnace of Babylon and in those flames he spoke to them you shall not burn their bodies, you shall not singe their hair, you shall not scorch their clothes, you have no power to burn them. And when they threw in Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, they threw them in the arms of the fourth man who ripped off their bonds, who linked his arms with them, and suddenly they were having a Jericho march inside the burning, fiery furnace of Babylon. And let me tell you, it's time for a new Jericho march. It's time that God ripped off the bonds of us and set us free from the powers of the devil, healing us from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Inside that furnace, they were moving around, walking around, and the fire had no power to burn them. The time passed and finally Nebuchadnezzar said, open, open the furnace door. I want to see the charred remains of these men who wouldn't bow, who said their faith is what they lived by and they refused to compromise. And when he looked in, he was astonished. He said to his counselors, didn't we cast three men bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace? He said, that's right, O king. He said, I see four. They're loose. They're not bound. They're walking around. They have no hurt. And the form of that fourth is like the Son of God. And he cried, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come forth and come hither. And they walked out, and he smelled of their hair, and there was no no scorch. He smelled of their clothes and there was no scorch. He smelled of their bodies and there was no smell of fire. And he cried, there's no God like this upon the earth. God had moved in to people who live by their faith, who will not bow, who stand up in the presence of the occult of the devil and say, you... I may burn in your furnace, but not I'll bow to your God. And God is saying, if you don't bow, I won't let you burn. <laughs> Number one, it is safer today in the furnace than it is out. Because if you're outside the furnace, you're like the mighty soldiers who bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and when they got ready to toss them in, they got too close, and the fire burned them up. 
It was unsafe to be outside that furnace. It was unsafe to be a compromiser. It was unsafe to bow the knee to this world. It was safer inside with the fourth man who had robbed the fire of its violence and subdued the crackling flames and unbound his servants and let them have the freedom to walk around without any hurt upon their flesh or upon their spirit. It's better to stand up and be persecuted for your testimony, for your faith, for the Christ that means more to you than life itself, than it is to take the applause and praise of this world and bow the knee to sin of any kind and walk the path of unrighteousness. It's not safe to live in the world today that is filled with sin and you're walking with it you're like a dead fish floating downstream. But God says we're to be a live fish swimming up the stream. It's not safe out there without Christ. It's not safe without the fourth man. It's not safe as a compromiser. It's not safe to try to live without faith. It's safer inside the furnace, inside the persecution, because that's where the master is. He's in there with those who believe God. He's in there with those who lift their hearts and their hands and say, he is my God, he is my Lord. It's safer inside. And number two, when you refuse to bow, there are no bonds upon you. Satan has no, nothing to wrap around you, to put you into bondage. You have the freedom the freedom of the Holy Ghost, the freedom to walk in blessed peace and the joy of the Lord. And number three, this promotion. Nebuchadnezzar promoted them to the highest rim in the kingdom and said there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Who is this fourth man? In Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, our high priest. In Numbers, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, the captain of our salvation. In Judges, our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, our reigning king. In Ezra, our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the broken walls of our lives. In Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, our ever-living redeemer. In in Psalms, he's the Lord our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In Isaiah, the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, the righteous branch. In, in Lamentations, of the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, the fourth man, the burning fire furnace. Who is this fourth man? In Hosea, he is the faithful husband forever married to the backslider. In Joel, the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, our burden bear, in Obadiah, the mighty to save, in Jonah, our great foreign missionary, in Micah, the messenger of beautiful feet, in Nahum, the avenger of God's elect, in Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist, crying, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in Zephaniah, he is the savior, in Haggai, he's the owner of all the silver and gold in the world, in Zechariah, he's, he's the fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and cleanness in Malachi. He's the, he's the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Who is this fourth man in Matthew? He's the Messiah. Mark, the wonder worker. Luke, the son of man. John, the son of God. Acts, the Holy Ghost. In Romans, our justifier. First Corinthians, the gifts of the spirit. In second Corinthians, the resurrection and the life. In Galatians, the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, a God who supplies all our needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus in glory. In Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead.
head bodily. First, second Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. First and second Timothy, our mediator between God and man. In Titus, our faithful pastor. In Philemon, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, the great physician. First and second Peter, the chief shepherd who soon shall appear with a crown of unfading glory. First, second, third John, everlasting love. In Jude, the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. In Revelation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. fourth man. He's Abel's sacrifice. He's Noah's rainbow. He's Abraham's ram. He's Isaac's wells and Jacob's ladder and Moses' rod and Samuel's horn of oil and David's slingshot and Hezekiah's sundial and Peter's healing shadow and the handkerchiefs and apron from Paul's body to heal the sick. He's a husband to the widow, a father to the orphan, to those traveling the dark night. He, he's the bright and morning star. To those in the lonesome valley, He's the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, and honey in the rock. Who is this fourth man? He's the prince of peace and the everlasting father, and the government of our life is upon his shoulder. Who is this fourth man? He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God. I want you to stand and give the king of glory the biggest hand you can. He is Jesus, the son of the living God. I believe that Love World USA was God's idea to show you the part of God and to also show you things like you saw today. We'll be showing you other things, by, by the way, in the future. I'll be doing a, a special interview with Maurice Sorello that may even be live. And uh, we have other amazing uh, footage with uh, Lester Semrall that was done also that I'd love to show you. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman, uh, I never interviewed her, but we have so many things on her life I'd like to show you. And other great saints of of God that we're going to bring to your, to the screen, to your home. So you can learn and you can discover what God did with them and, and why God used them. And I believe God will use you in a great way. So please be in tune and tell your friends about Love World USA, because like I just said, Love World USA, I believe was God's idea. When Pastor Chris and I prayed together, I'll never forget the anointing we both felt twice, and we were actually weeping. I was on my knees here in California. He was on his knees in Nigeria. We were both praying on the phone, feeling the anointing of God so strong on us as we began talking about uh, this partnership we're in now to have Love World, and today Love World is a reality. This is really exciting for all of us, and we need your partnership. I mean, today America needs a revival. It's shocking. Uh, there was a report a few days ago on Fox News. 52 uh, percent, 52 percent of Christians in America, in America, don't believe Jesus lived a sinless life. Think about that. Like, it's a shock that people who call themselves Christians in this country don't even believe that the Lord lived a, a pure life. It's like, wow, where did they come from? And, and a large percentage, like 50-something percent, don't even believe there is a devil. I'm, I'm talking about Christians in this country who call themselves Christians. And it's just shocking to see what's going on out there. So we need Love World USA. Love World USA is needed now because America is in a declined state spiritually. 
And we need this network for our children, our grandchildren, as you probably, I'm worried about my grandkids' future and my children's future. Because I lived at a time years ago when the power of God was flowing in this country. Now you can hardly even see it out there. So we need this network. And that's why I'm asking you to be a partner with us and to call the number on the screen, 855-378-9993. If you care, listen, if you care about your children and about your grandkids or your family members to have a future where God is a part of their life, we need this network. We have no choice, to be honest with you. Because where do you hear messages on the blood? Where, where do you see miracles, signs and wonders? This network is all about Jesus. That's it. And that's the way it's going to stay as long as I'm alive and Pastor Chris is alive. Because that's our commitment to the Lord. To the Lord, not to you. We've made that vow to the Lord himself on our knees. That this network is for his glory, not ours. So I need you right now to get, get on the phone. And for anyone who will, who will uh, send a gift, I want to send you this prayer shawl that both Pastor Chris and, and I prayed over. Now think about, this is only a piece of cloth. and you know? We're actually calling it healing shawl because when we prayed, we released the healing anointing on it. And I'll never forget as we walked around laying hands. You know, often in our crusades, I feel something on my right hand. I felt that years, but I felt a very strong, very strong, uh, like electricity hit me as I'm laying hands on these prayer shawls. So we have still quite a few of them in the studio, and we want to send you one for a gift of $50 for your donation. And if you become a partner, if you join as a partner, you'll also get one of these. So a partner means that you give a, 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 a monthly gift uh, to the ministry. And for those that will give $50, you'll get this right away. For those who will be partners with us for many years to come, we're going to send you this one, uh, this one of these two. Because we just want to say thank you to you. I mean, you know, you, you really cannot buy the anointing. Only, you know, a fool believes that. But we want you to give a gift so we can send you something that we believe is really priceless because the, the, the anointing of God has been released on it. It's not the shawl, it's what's on the shawl. So call the number, 855-378-9993, or do it online, loveworldusa.org. So thank you, and please be watching. Tell your friends. Spread the word for us about the network. Blessings to you. Love you. Bye-bye.